Hi, I'm Davin. Welcome back to the studio. Today, we're doing part two of our rocks glass series. You can watch part one here and get a feel for what we did. But basically, we made a set of these. Simple cylinders made to specific dimensions, which is sort of tricky. We use calipers and try to get the same amount of glass each time, that whole thing. Um, these are double old fashions, low ball, or rocks glasses, they're called those things variously. By the way, if you're a glass geek like I am, or an aspiring glass blower, you should at least have a passing knowledge of the various forms and their names of functional drinkware, along with, you know, the dimensions of those things. You know, what's the difference between a low ball and a high ball and a Collins glass? How much liquid do each of them hold? You know, we're all familiar with that basic intro to glass project where you have to make a cylinder that can hold 12 ounces. It's because a lot of things come in 12 ounce cans or 12 ounce bottles. And that's great and that's fine. But being able to control the dimensions and the scale of what you're making is probably the, like, the next step in um, a glass blower's growth where you're not just letting the glass tell you how big it's gonna be. Anyway, that's an aside. What we're gonna do today is take these very sort of plain, even though I like them, very plain, um, simple drinking glasses, and we're gonna take them up a notch. We're gonna start not in the hot shop, but in the cold shop. Well, actually, we're gonna start on my computer, a little bit of designing, a little bit of Sharpie, then we're gonna take our way into the cold shop and we're gonna do some cutting to make these look like old-fashioned cut crystal rocks glasses. And then, to finish it off, we're gonna end up back in the hot shop where we started. Stay tuned. I think you're going to like where this is going. Remember to like and subscribe. Leave a comment below if there's something you want to see or if there's something you think I could do better. And uh, let's get into it. Okay, so what we're doing here is trying to figure out the appropriate height um, and then how to get that pattern onto the surface like that. Now, this was freehand drawn. I sort of figured out where to split the bottom you know, kind of guessing a little bit. Um, and then started to draw the pattern. So this is the first leaf, you know, this is the, the high leaf here. And then I'll have to come back and draw the bottom one. I don't want to do all of these freehand. So I kind of came up with this pattern idea that I would print it out. Um, and then I could uh, put that on the mark. So that's lining up with these um, these Sharpie marks that I did on the bottom here. And the way I got those was really simple. In Illustrator, I generated a circle and then I used my polygon tool, told it to have three sides, made that inside of the circle that's the same diameter, selected one side, and it tells me that the length of that one side is about slightly less than two and three quarter inches. I set my calipers to that, simple. And if they all line up, then I've got um, them equally spaced. I'm putting them in boxes here because, like this, because um, I want that to line up with this mark. So that upright, that vertical lines up with the mark there. Now, I'm glad I did this because when I, when I used my original pattern, my original design that I was using on these, it's too tall. It's going to cut into the thin, up here is really, really thin on the glass. As you can see, it's like 3, 30 seconds, a little bit over a sixteenth. But it gets really thick down at the bottom here. So uh, I, I realized that was too tall, so I took those patterns and I, and I squashed them. And that gave me this. And that's much better. The issue is, I realized, man, there's a lot of fronds here. That's going to be too much to cut in with the V-wheel. It, it's just too close. It's going get, to get cluttered. So I went in. I... I took apart some of the, um, pulled out some of the fronds, as you can see here, and um, made it so that they're more spaced out. That's more going to match my V wheel when I go to cut it. The process we're going to be using involves a lot of water, right? And um, that washes away regular oil sharpie, even if the surface is clean. I've tried it. So I'm going to test a couple of things. I'm going to test a silver sharpie. The other thing I'm going to do, which I think, which I know is going to work, is I'm going to take, make these into a pattern and Dremel, use a little tiny Dremel burr bit, like a little diamond burr, 
and just mark where all those lines are, right? Um, and then once I've got all those lines marked, I'll Sharpie over the lines and then the Sharpie will sink into that grit and it shouldn't wash off while I'm grinding it. If I wanted to make sure that these lines went all the way up, I could use something like this. Run that up against that Sharpie that I have on the bottom. And then just run a vertical line right there. So this is the part where I have to admit that I sort of dropped the ball on, on logic here. Um, I kind of have uh, one of my principles when I'm working is that I always try the simplest option first. Even if it doesn't, even if it seems like it's just no way it's going to work. And so what I should have done here was start with the silver Sharpie. Previous to this, when I did the last version of these, I had used the black Sharpie. Well, I know that washes off because, well, I saw it wash off. So, I then thought, okay, silver Sharpie, because that seems a little more tenacious on shiny polished glass in particular. But then I thought, well, what if that doesn't work? I need a backup plan. And so my backup plan was what I had talked about um, earlier, which is I'm going to put Sharpie through this pattern, use my little Dremel Burr tool, and follow all the middles of those uh, fronds. And then I'll go back over those ground lines, those, those little abraded lines, and fill those in with Sharpie. That way, when the other Sharpie starts to wash off, I at least have the lines that show where all of those fronds are so I can follow those with my V wheel when I'm cutting it in the coal shop. I should have not wasted my time doing this even though I knew it would work because it turns out that as you'll see later I pretty much strictly end up using the silver sharpie because um, when I tried the silver sharpie which I tried second um, it worked better. I mean, it works perfectly, right? And so, again, it was just like a lesson in logic. You know, I wanted to, I was like, oh, I don't have that much time. I want to make sure that this is, this is done right. I, I spent this time making these really nice cups. Uh, I want to make sure that I get at least one good one of these. So I picked the best one. This is my best of the set. And this is what I did the black Sharpie and the Dremel on. But like I said, it turns out that the Silver Sharpie was fine. So why didn't I try the Silver Sharpie first? Um, I was happy to work on this uh, really nice cup first. And I knew that this would work. So I was like, well, I'm going to be prepared so that I can just move to this because I have a feeling the Silver Sharpie won't work. I chose my second favorite cup, the one that wasn't quite as tall, not quite as thin, not quite as straight. And I just thought, you know what, okay, if, if one of these is going to mess up and I'm going to have problems, um, it's probably going to be the Silver Sharpie. So I'm just going to pick my second cup and, and do the Silver Sharpie on it, which is what I did. But if I had been using Logic, I would have did the Silver Sharpie first on my least favorite cup, taking it into the coal shop, taking the V-wheel to it, and s just sort of tested it to see what it did. Then I wouldn't have had to spend a half hour doing all the black Sharpie and the Dremel tool on the other cup, which turns out um, was sort of a waste of time. So anyway, it was a good lesson for myself. Um, I'm glad I did both. I now have two sort of uh, methods in my, in my toolbox, but I should have followed logic and it, it was just a, a kind of a nice reminder to myself that, um, you know, stick to that principle of try the simplest thing first. It might work. So here we are 
we are getting ready to use our marker lathe. You probably noticed that I just sort of shoved that in there by hand. You do not need to hammer those things in. Th these arbors are designed to just sort of wedge in there. I don't, I don't use a wrench to tighten them either. They're sort of self-tightening as you cut. If you're cutting on a V-wheel like this through transparent glass, you should be looking through your object. That way you can position the wheel exactly. And if you're grinding away Sharpie like I am or some other kind of mark, you grind until that mark is gone. And um, yeah, it works really, really well. So instead of looking down on it from the side or from the top, I'm looking through the object at that v wheel cutting. And I think, I think in a second here, you'll see a, a pretty decent shot of that. Right now, what you can see me doing is I'm holding the surface of the glass sort of perpendicular to that um, to that wheel, uh, but actually, what I started to realize is I could I could really put some gesture into some of these fronds and make parts have like a a bigger, more rounded part half of the leaf that matches uh, how a leaf would look like. So here's a good example. So I'm just holding that on the wheel until it grinds all or most of that Sharpie away. And what I discovered later on was that I could rock the, the glass that I've got in my hand. Once I touched down, I could rock it in one direction and it would grind away a, a bigger radius out of one side than the other. And so I could sort of put some, you know, um, some gestural quality to some of these cuts so they're not just straight cuts. And I'm glad I figured that out on the first cup so I wasn't testing it on the nice cup. Um, but at every point during this process, I'm trying to figure out ways to, to sort of improve what I'm doing. So glad I figured that out um, on this test cup. So here we are back in the hot shop and you might wonder, what are we doing back here? Are we making another cup? Nope. We put those glasses after they had been wheel cut into a kiln and sent them up over a period of hours up to 11.25. Um, so they're sitting face down in the kiln right now at that temperature. It turns out I probably don't need to go that high with that temperature. I probably could have done it at 1100, maybe even 1080. What I'm doing right here is I'm putting a little hot skin on the face of that punty while the back of that punty got colder, so the back set up. So between that cold back of the punty and then a cold bottom on this cup that's sitting in the kiln, even though it's at 11, something that's still pretty cold, it um, sets up really quickly and freezes onto the surface um, of the cup and then allows me to be able to, to go ahead, do all the work that I need to do um, with the torch and the um, furnace. So on, on the first one of these, I attempted to use the reheating oven sorry, the reheating furnace here to um, fire polish the surface. Turns out that's not a great move when you're dealing with cups that have such thin rims like these do. Uh, it overheats them and causes them to, uh, to bead up and you'll see that um, later on. So here I am, I'm using the torch and just sort of fuzzing that surface a bit. I think this is actually the second cup that I picked up because the rim looks really crispy and, and this looks a little bit taller. So I'm pretty sure, I, I did a video of both. I think this is uh, the first cup. You can see the rim is a little weird and wonky. I think that's the second cup. So what you're seeing here, um, just so there's no confusion, is just an edit together of the process, the whole process of picking up a cup and polishing it, but you're seeing sort of edit together two different cups because um, I actually only have one camera. So I um, uh, I didn't choose to move it around during the process. I set it up for one process um, for the first cup, did it, moved the camera for the second cup, and then did it again. 
So you can see that those frosted surfaces uh, that are wheel cut are getting um, getting shinier. And so I'm keeping the cup fairly cold. I'm taking really short flashes here. So when I'm going back to the reheating furnace, to the, to the glory hole, I'm only going in there for 10 to 15 seconds. They're pretty short flashes. I just um, want to keep that piece sort of on hold, but I don't want it moving and I don't want the rim thickening up on me. I want to keep that crispy rim and I'm just fire polishing those uh, frosted surface. How this works is that torch is so incredibly hot. It's um, oxy natural gas torch, very similar to an oxy propane torch. Um, it's so hot that it's just sort of frying just the very surface, but it's a small flame. It's not a lot of BTUs. What I mean is it's, that torch is almost certainly hotter than the reheating oven, but the reheating oven is a greater amount of heat and the mass of heat affects the entire cup, whereas this is just affecting the surface. Um, so when I'm thinking about heat, uh, like I said on the first one I attempted to, to use the hole, to use the reheating furnace to fire polish it, and it was like getting everything too hot. So here I can avoid going in the rim, and I'm, you can see that I'm moving around a lot too because I don't want to heat one area so much that the heat soaks in and softens that part of the cup. And I just kept doing this um, over and over until I got the cup to be shiny. And there I use my jacks just to make sure that everything is straight and on center, um, touching up a few little areas. And then I think we are real close to being done. Um, yeah. So if you do this right, this second cup, I think I picked up uh, around 1100, not 1125. Um, I still torched the tip of the punty, but you'll see here in a second that um, I just touch right where the punty touches the bottom of the cup with my shears, a couple of little taps, and it breaks right off, no problem. It leaves like a little bit of a thing on there, but um, I am about to torch that away and um, stamp my little skull. Got a graphite rod that I've carved a skull into, and I use that to push in and that removes um, that removes the mark of the punty. You've got to make sure that the bottom of your cup is indented enough so that when you do that and it pushes all that material aside, it doesn't leave a raised area where the cup won't sit flat. And then I put it into our annealing oven where it will sit and slowly cool down overnight to room temperature. Well, that about wraps it up for this project. Thanks for coming along on the little adventure that we had here. Hope this gives you a greater appreciation for those. Maybe your, your grandmother's uh, cut crystal glasses. Um, each one of those grooves would have been cut and then oftentimes polished by hand. Um, they were definitely cut by hand. They might have, in some cases, used uh, an acid to polish them, but a lot of times they were polished by hand. It gives you an idea of the amount of work. You know, first you have to blow an object um, either by freehand or into a mold, and then it's sent to the cutting floor where uh, artisans, uh, craftspeople carefully cut those forms. And they're doing a lot of that freehand to get those lovely patterns on there. So hopefully this gives you a little bit more of appreciation. I know it did for me, even though I'm cheating and I'm using a uh, fire polishing technique to remove the grit and the frosted surface that that V-wheel leaves, still there's a lot that goes into these um, to making something that does this um, which is why I'm giving myself a little bit of license a little bit of flexibility in the fact that my set is um, no longer a set yeah the first one I picked up you probably could see in the video there it it got overheated wasn't punted quite on center and I had to compress that flare down, which thickened the rim a good bit and just made it shorter. Like I said in the video, the glass does not want to be 16th of an inch thick. It wants to be a quarter of an inch thick. And so if you overheat that rim, once you get it, it'll, it'll bead back up, um, uh, which I talked about in the very first video, uh, which was making these without cutting them. 
Anyway, like and subscribe. Hope I see you again soon. Leave a comment below if you appreciate this. Share it with friends. Um, and I'll see you again next time. Cheers.